although I've already scheduled writing for tomorrow. So that's kind of a lie, but we got to get GFL book seven done and get rolling from there. All right, guys, let's almost to 401. Let me go to Maine and you can see my smiling face. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Monster of the Week. Hello, Kyle. Everybody else in the chat room. This is going to be a fun one. My guest today is Mike Cole. And on the show, we try and pimp a guest book and one of my books. The book we're pimping for Mike today is The Bronze Lie. And I am almost finished with it. I bought it in hardcover and then I bought it in audiobook so I could listen to it while I'm out walking the dogs and everything. It's uh, it, it's it's wonderful and Mike will tell you about that in a minute. The book I am pimping today for myself because Mike's book um, Legion versus Phalanx was so instrumental in Aliens Phalanx. I of course, if you hear anything you hear Mike say that is of remote interest, means you should go out and buy both of these books right away and enjoy them. And uh, that is that. And now hold on here. Before we get to Mike, let me go through the upcoming guests. We are off for a couple of weeks. We'll be back in November, November 15th. Author Gail Carriger. She's going to be talking about Celine from Underworld. So that is uh, two women who have very unique styles of clothing. So it should be a very good episode. Gail is awesome. I know Mike's met Gail a few times. She's wonderful. I'm really, really looking forward to that. The week after that, we have rescheduled the wonderful Bronson Pin show is going to be on. I did boof that episode a couple weeks ago, but we've got our technical problems figured out. He is going to join us, and he is also a fantastic dude. And then on November 19th, scientist Dr. Kiki Sanford, who is verklempt. She can't figure out what monster she wants to do, so she is still undecided. She said she has a list of 20 monsters, and she is having anxiety attacks trying to figure out which one she is going to talk to us about. So I look forward to that. Let me give you my guest bio, and we will meet the man. As a security contractor, government civilian, and military officer, Mike's career has run the gamut from counterterrorism to cyber warfare to federal law enforcement. He served three tours in Iraq and was recalled to serve during deep water Horizon oil spill. He is a TV personality appearing on the show's Contact and Hunted as a fiction writer. He is the author of the Dark Fantasy Sacred Throne trilogy, the military fantasy Shadow Ops, and the prequel Shadow Ops Reawakening trilogy. Mike, welcome to Monster of the Week. How you doing? Good. Thanks so much for having me. I'm psyched to it's going to be very fun. Everybody, we've got a little bit of a lag coming from Mike, so if there's anything that doesn't quite come through, I will be sure to ask him again. And here you can all see your, your shiny, happy names in the chat room. We'll get to questions for Mike in the chat room just a little bit. Uh, we are going to dive into Nessus, the Slayer of Hercules, in a manner of speaking in a minute. But first of all, uh, we had to, I have to go over, there's Mike's The Bronze Lie. Mike, as long as I got you on the show, have to give you a public thank you for all the help you gave me for Aliens Phalanx. The book up on the screen now is Legion versus Phalanx. Mike would take texts at all hours of the day, any day of the week, and immediately respond with very thoughtful, knowledgeable stuff. And uh, Aliens Phalanx would not be anywhere near the book that it is without your help, Mike. So I want to say thank you very much for that. Well, thank you. I, I love talking about this stuff. So any excuse to do it, it was a real, it was a real joy getting the help. Now, when you were writing this uh, treatise on ancient warfare, did it ever, did it ever occur to you that that might be used as source material for a far future sci-fi book? Yeah, of course. I mean, look, uh, there's such an overlap. One of the reasons I think I was compelled to become a, a warfare historian is that there's such an overlap in fantasies, right? Anybody who likes Tolkien has <clears throat> vested interest or Brooks, you know, that all comes from a, a abiding interest in evil warfare. Mm -hmm. And ancient warfare isn't, isn't a far step from it. And we have lots of examples of far future stories that involve kind of medieval or, or ancient tinges. Star Wars, of course, being mm -hmm. the best example, where, you know, the, it's almost the samurai style sort based uh, military culture mm -hmm. even to purported the future and uh, dune as well a lot of a lot of feudal medieval type approaches to everything oh warhammer okay i mean the in, in one of my favorite favorite far future sci-fi universes for those of your listeners it's it's uh, they probably already know but it's a gaming universe not necessarily a universe although there is fiction tie-in but there's just as much hand-to-hand -hand combat and just as much armor and shields as there yes. is bolters and ladders in that and series, so. A wonderful yeah. miniature game. If you're in tabletop gaming, Warhammer is yeah. pretty darn fun. All right, let's now, we're going to get into this. First of all, let's go back to get this up. Tell us about the bronze lie for a couple minutes before we get into the monster. 
Sure. So, um, look, I don't want to get too political, uh, but I, I sort of am an avowed leftist, and I saw a disturbing rise uh, beginning in 2016, not on the liberal right, you know, the reasonable folks, we can have disagreements, but the the extreme right. We're talking, you know, the golden dawn in Greece and the Oath Keepers in the United States. Um, and using the image of the Spartans as the world's greatest badasses, the warriors who surrendered and never ran from a fight um, as a galvanizing symbol. Um, and uh, that was really troubling to me. And at the same time, a, a professor named Sarah Bond at the University of Iowa published a really great takedown of the whole Spartan myth um, in, a, in a, a sadly a now defunct journal called Adelon. You can I'll probably still find the article online. It's called This Is Not Sparta by Sarah Bond. And um, I read it and I thought, wow, has anybody looked at this from a strictly military perspective? Mm -hmm. Because we have lots of sources that document when the Spartans won, when the Spartans lost. Did they run from a fight? Did they surrender? Has anybody gone through and made a scorecard and just kept track? Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out in the popular press, nobody had. Um, so I thought, well, this is really simple. Why doesn't somebody tell? Story. And I went through and I did that research and I, and as I went through it, it was really amazing uh, because I be, also became very inspired by the, the Spartan successes. And by the end of it, it was no longer a takedown. It was more a seeing of, of the, of the human, both the, the flaws and the failures and the glory mm -hmm. of the real Spartans. But I won't lie, my goal in doing it initially was political. I wanted to take this galvanizing symbol away from the most extreme elements of the political right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I do think that the book has done that. I just got attacked on Twitter by Mike Cernovich, who's sort of one of the famous alt-right leaders in the United States. So if, if, if that's the kind of attention I'm attracting, uh, then uh, I'm, uh, I'm doing well. But I do want to reiterate, I, I didn't write this book also to have the far left use it as a as a club to beat reasonable people with. Right. My goal here is not to slam the Spartans, it is to see them. And uh, there's been a lot, I think, of, of great attention in that regard. And the history in this book, it it outlines a, you know, a military-based culture that has many wins and many losses. Not this undefeated juggernaut, but there's just right. so much depth to this book in this massive, broad span of time covering Sparta and the people of the region. And it, it's just, uh, you guys, if you have any interest in history, military history at all, I highly recommend it. It's a super, super great book. All right. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into horse people. Mike... <laughs> First of all, you you wanted to talk about uh, Nessus. Out of all the monsters of the world that you could have picked to chat about on the show, why this one? Why Nessus? Why centaurs? So two reasons. Because you know, look, I'm in the history game now, and I'm doing mostly ancient stuff, and 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 this is all focusing on ancient Greece. So it needed to be an ancient Greek monster. But Nessus was special to me because so much of Sparta's myth centers around the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC. Mm -hmm. This is the battle that the film 300 and the 1998 um, uh, Frank Miller comic of the same name was written about. Mm -hmm. And I have been I have been to Thermopylae twice and done surveys of the site. It's an incredible place. I highly recommend any of your listeners you can get to Greece to go visit it, go visit it, you will get chills. Well, Thermopylae means hot gates in Greek. Um, and it's called the hot gates because there's this beautiful bubbling um, hot spring that people go to, hmm. to take uh, to convalescence, uh, dangle their feet in. And it has, it flows through this gorgeous channel, which has blue green algae. So it's this sort of like glowing blue green channel that the uh, water's through steam rises from it. it. Smells like rotten eggs from all the hmm. sulfur. It's super, super cool. But the myth about how that water got to boil now, we know in, in 2021 that it has to do with um, geothermal tectonics and how water is going down in the core of the earth and being heated and coming back up. But the ancient Greeks believed it was a very different story. And the core of that story is Nessus and his, as you said, his assassination of Hercules mm -hmm. through, a very, um, through a very sort of clandestine manner. And that's why he had to be the, 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 the monster I tried out on here. So break down... This, uh, I, I may have misled all of you in my promo land. Nessus is the killer of Hercules, but not, not in the uh, mano a mano fight in the hot gates manner. Mike, how did Nessus kill the legend, the indestructible Hercules? So he did it with trickery, um, which is great. Uh, and, uh, and, and sort of like, it doesn't always have to be chest bumping. You know, there's lots of ways to get a job done. Uh, I will say this. He, he, he first looked the Greek, the ancient Greeks are an epically misogynistic culture. There's just no way around it. So a lot of these stories about centaurs have to do with the abduction of women. 
Um, and uh, so Nessus attempted to abduct uh, Hercules' wife, Deonara. And Hercules, to prevent this from happening, he had already killed the Lernaean Hydra as one of his 12 labors. The Lernaean Hydra, folks remember, is this many-headed snake or many-headed dragon where if you cut one head off, two heads grew back. Well, this Hydra, less well-known, had highly poisonous blood, so poisonous that just breathing the fumes of the air where this Hydra lived would kill you. So mm -hmm. after Hercules killed this Hydra, he dipped arrows in its blood to okay. make them poisonous. And he fired uh, one of these arrows into Nessus and killed him as Nessus is trying to abduct his wife. Now, at the same time, Hercules had brought on a concubine, this woman, Iole. And back then it was normal for, especially in ancient Greece, for men to have multiple wives. And Dianara, she certainly accepted that Hercules had a concubine, but she was worried that this concubine would usurp her position as first wife, as premier wife. She was very jealous. So Nessus, even as he lay dying, poisoned by this arrow that Hercules had shot him with, turns to Dianara and goes, hey, if you want Hercules to be faithful, I'm, I'm finished. But if you want him to be faithful, my blood used as a tincture will make him faithful, make any man <laughs> faithful. So take some of my blood and use it. So Dainara takes the blood, spreads it on a robe, and gives it to Hercules as a gift. Later on, she's at home and figures out that this might have been a trick and pours some of Nessus's blood on the floor and it starts smoking. And she realizes, oh, my God. This is poison. I killed my husband. She sends a runner to Hercules to warn him. The runner doesn't get there in time. Hercules has put the robe on. It sticks to him. It starts burning him alive. And in an effort to save, his, save himself, he jumps into the springs of Thermopylae. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't save him. It doesn't wash the blood off, but the water starts to boil. And according to the ancients, it still boils to this day. That's why the springs of Thermopylae are hot. But in the end, the pain drives him mad, and he winds up being immolated on a funeral pyre, so it didn't save him. Now, we're, we're going to get to the broader, the broader centaur myth in a minute. But first of all, sure. let's discuss, you know, uh, Centaurs Anonymous. They don't handle their booze very well. I, I saw no. that in some of the research, that they're not that, not that good with, uh, with the grape, so to speak. What is their deal with that? So this is a stand-in, right? So this is a stand-in for Greek, the, the ancient Greeks— had two big problems. One is they were really concerned about unwatered wine. This is a trope you'll see. You have to remember that in the ancient world, people drank their wine by cutting it with water. And this was considered to be a barbaric custom if you drank your wine straight. Hmm. The, Spartan King, the Spartan King Cleomenes I supposedly had this incredible career that was ended because he got hooked on drinking unwatered wine. I don't believe it's a true story, but it's in Herodotus if people want to read it. And it's the same thing for these centaurs, right? But it was a stand-in for the Greek concern between civilization and barbarism. To the ancient okay. Greeks, they were the civilized people, right? In fact, the word barbarian comes from the Greek barbaros, which just basically means these people, they don't speak Greek. Everything they say sounds like bar, 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 bar. <laughs> so, uh, and barbarians engage in erratic, wild, undisciplined customs, like drinking their wine on water. And, and when they do drink it, they can't hold it. They become wild and, and, and a danger and a threat, particularly to women. It's always this misogynist protection of women and the, the fear that the barbarians are going to come and do something to them. So in, in the myth, we can detect this sort of Greek insecurity about foreigners, about people from outside their culture and their inability to handle liquor. But it is a, a constant in all the myths about centaurs. And I checked even in Dungeons and Dragons, it persists even in the uh, game Banner Saga. I checked that there's a a Kantar race that appear in Banner Saga 2, which is a fantastic video game, but it's a, a Norse-themed video game that has okay. centaurs in it. And they, too, have a problem with they're wild and can't control themselves, especially under the influence of liquor. So that really seems to be something that, that stuck. And now they're the most famous centaur, I think, and it sort of took me a minute to hit this, even though I am a Sagittarius, is Sagittarius, <laughs> of course, being this, being the, the famous centaur. And that goes right. back, that goes back to Chiron and Achilles. So right. I'm sure you know something about this. Tell us like the origin of the centaur myth. And it's all right. Yeah. So, so there's two sides of the myth, right? And remember Chiron is the good centaur. Most centaurs are supposedly descended from Centaurus. So Apollo had two sons, Apollo being the sun and wine and archery god that uh, has the oracle at Delphi that I'm sure all your listeners are familiar with. Two sons, kind of a Cain and Abel, a good son and a bad son by this, by this river nymph. 
And Lapithes is the good son who mm-hmm. spawns a race of mighty warriors. And Centauros is the bad son, this okay. sort of twisted, screw up kid. And Centauros is so screwed up that he has sex with mares. He starts banging horses. I don't know how else to say it's it. Not a good, not and, a good look. And from this, the the centaurs are born, and they have the same kind of wild and you know vicious and unconstrained tendencies. And finally, a wedding occurs in which the sons of Centaurus and the sons of Apophis are invited to. And at this wedding, because the centaurs cannot handle their wine, they try to abduct. And you know, I'm using the term abduct so as not to offend anybody, but you get the idea. All the women and boys at the mm-hmm. um, at the wedding, and this leads to the Centauromachy, which is this war between the, Lapith, the, the, the descendants of Lapithes and the descendants of Centaurus. And that kind of sets the tone for how centaurs interact with humans, these wild creatures. Now, Chiron is a great, a different example in that he is the son of a titan okay. uh, who disguises himself as a horse when he sleeps with a woman he's trying to sleep with. So he too comes out as a centaur, but not in this shameful way of having a man having sex with mares, which just goes to show you the, the <laughs> double standard in, in you so know- uh, man, having, things- man having sex with mares, bad. Woman having sex with a horse, okay. That's just, what we're- just fine, right, yeah, I mean, it's nuts. <laughs> and, and in art, Chiron, the way they distinguish Chiron is that his front legs, he's still a centaur, uh-huh. but instead of having his front horse legs, they're human legs, and he wears clothes. And that's the artistic cue to the viewer, hey, this is a good centaur. I see. And he, he is raised by Apollo, and he learns to become a great archer. He's taught botany and pharmacy. He becomes this great plant medicine leader, and he winds up training all of these heroes out of Greek myth. He trains Hercules himself. He trains Achilles to play the lyre. There's a famous painting of him um, teaching him to train the lyre. He trains Ajax, who's one of the heroes on the um, Greek side at the Trojan War. Mm -hmm. And he becomes this figure of sort of like the noble savage, right? Maybe he comes from a a savage line, but he's okay. We like this guy. Okay. Um, And in the end, um, his life is ruined by Hercules. Um, because Hercules comes to a dinner with Chiron and another good centaur named Pholos. Mm -hmm. And Pholos has a a jar of sacred wine given to him, I think, by by the wine god Dionysus. And the the implication is, this is sacred, right? You know, you don't just pop this open any time. And and Hercules wants a drink. And he says, we're going to open that sacred wine. And he kind of intimidates him into doing it. Well, the second Pholos opens the jar of sacred wine. Remember, they're in centaur country. Um, the fumes of the wine alone are enough to intoxicate all the neighboring centaurs. And they go on a mad <laughs> rampage. And Hercules pulls out these poisoned arrows. Remember, we told you about before. Yep. To fight them off. And in the process, he scratches Chiron with one of them. And that's the end of Chiron. And there's an, an added to the tragedy is Pholus, who could have been a successor to Chiron, another good centaur. He's so bemused that something as little as an arrow could kill a man that he picks up one of the poisoned arrows but he accidentally drops it and it touches his hoof and he too is instantly Boom. killed. Gone. Boom. Gone. So it's this horrible tragedy that yeah. is all Hercules. The, the accidents in the, in the Greek myths are great. Now yeah. we've had a lot of cool monsters so far. There's so many more monsters to go through for future guests on this show. Uh, a monster that ages very well and is very scary, like Medusa. We had Medusa on mm-hmm. uh, a few weeks ago and you know, the snake heads turning people into stone I've got concerns that half man, half horse hasn't aged that well in the fear and terror department. <laughs> do you do you feel the centaur has? How is the centaur aged as a as as something that would strike fear? Because I think ancient Greeks and people in that time were around big ass horses a lot more than modern Americans are. If you yeah. stood next to a draft horse, they're terrifying and they are yeah. perfectly calm. Has yeah. this? How do you think this is aged? The concept of the half man, half horse as a monster. It's, it's it hasn't at all right it's not scary to modern people and some of this is because of dungeons and dragons some of this is because of of the sort of fantasy rehabilitation of the centaur as a kind of a, a sylvan creature that lives in the natural woods and is like an elf is glorious and is um you know sort of noble out in nature right but what i love about the centaur is not the fear that it engenders in a modern person but the lens it gives us on what ancient greeks were afraid of okay. is that These are people who had fought so hard to claw civilization, as they saw it, out of a barbaric world. And the ancient world was pretty scary in a lot of ways. And this idea that you were just a glass of wine away 
from losing it all, or that it would all be taken away from you by invading barbarians, be they Scythians, be they Persians, be they other people, you know, the, the people who don't speak Greek. Mm -hmm. And the centaur is a terrifying monster to them, I think, because it symbolizes how easily what they have fought for has could be lost. Right. And that to me is incredibly moving. And is there is there anything to, you know, like the horse clans and raiders and barbarians, et cetera, being able to move very fast and strike outlying villages, cities, towns, mount on a horseback? Is that image of man and horse together? Could that be part of the source of the original terror? Absolutely, because, uh, and I, I wish I'd mentioned this before, is the Lapithes, remember I told you about the good son and his people, were Centaurus, and they're from Thessaly, which is northeastern Greece, with, again, a beautiful country that I encourage people to visit. And it's known as horse country, right? It's known as, a, uh, even today, it's where horses are raised and ridden in Greece. Um, and yes, the, the sort of core of the Greek military in the classical age was their hoplites, their heavy infantry men who fought on foot in heavy armor. And they sort of didn't have much of an answer uh, to people who were more gifted in the mounted territory, which is why there was also a lot of terror over the, the very sort of um, uh, uh, horse heavy uh, Persian military yep. and, and a lot of fear of these Northern horse lords. So yes, I do think there was an aspect of that terror in there as well. And that surprised me when I was reading the bronze lie is that it's, you know, the, the lack of, cavalry in the early early days and when cavalry did show up how much it changed the scope of war and changed the battlefield so yeah. this concept of the other the you know the the non-greek coming in mounted on a yeah. horse and bringing terror with it we can't get it today but back then it would just be absolutely terrifying and when you visit Greece, it makes total sense because one of the things, I mean, look, Greece is magic. I, I cannot recommend people go to Greece enough. And Lord knows they need the tourist dollars right now. It's expensive to get to, but it's free once you get there, basically, because prices are so low to try to attract people. Mm -hmm. You have never seen a more mountain choked country in your life. Okay. Everything is a glorious mountain every two feet. And the and there's some Boeotian plain in central Greece and the Thessalian plain in northeastern Greece, but basically it's just mountain after mountain after mountain. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can't really run cavalry in country like that. You know, you you can have small elements of them, but in terms of really having a, a dedicated cavalry corps, the country just doesn't isn't conducive to it. What I found is the bellwether, the the benchmark of this no longer being a truly scary monster is not even the sci-fi channel has a movie called centaur i looked i went on imdb and we are not seeing a lot of centaurs these days i ask you expert on greek military history a very knowledgeable man in the world of myths what do we do to jazz up the centaur and get it back into the world of making people poo their pants when they see one so you, if I, folks have got to play the Banner Saga series of games because uh, they do an amazing job of making, I believe it's with Banner Saga 2. There's three, uh, it's made by Stoic and it's published it by, I believe, Versus Evil. It's an amazing video game to begin with. It has a lot of incredible historical elements, but their depiction of centaurs in the game, even though the centaurs are good guys, are truly terrifying. Okay. Uh, not just in their wildness, but in their warrior ethic and the way they look like it's, they that will scare you that's what we need get a little bit more of that going all right mike and what we got a couple minutes left are there any other uh monsters that you can think of greek monsters that have not also not aged well i mean most of them are pretty still pretty solid yeah i mean the minotaur uh like the minotaur it's such an incredible at the center of a maze it's also the product of a mismatched love affair it devours human flesh it it's possibly a stand-in for a, a, a dozen other historical things there's books written about it um and it's a, a monster in D, &D right like mm -hmm. it's a humanoid race i think even play in some games um but no one's really like looked into it and given it a rehabilitation as an element of fear mm -hmm. um and look it's always and i understand it's a bit of a stretch people think of minotaur and be like how are you going to make that scary but i love that challenge like that's what writers live for right there was a, a comic book series a mini series called the minotaur and i can't remember who wrote it right now, but I did. I read it and it was it was pretty good. Mike, now that you're done with your second nonfiction work, and, and how are you feeling now about your creative process? Do you go back to more more fiction or are you already working in the next nonfiction? What is next for you in the creative space? I got three things going. Um, I'm loving history uh, and I'm getting a good reception for it. Plus, 
the history stuff is, is opening me up. I was, you know, I sold articles now to Slate and Smithsonian Magazine and the New Republic. And I'm, you know, I really love participating in the national conversation of letters. And uh, that feels really good to me. So uh, I have a book uh, on another ancient history project. I can't spoil it yet. Um, that is currently with an agent that I'm co-authoring with uh, Michael Livingston. He has three wonderful fantasy books on tour. And uh, his most recent history book is Never Greater Slaughter, which I, he's a medieval warfare expert, but he also does ancient work with me. And hopefully that book will sell. So you'll have something from us together. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, last name Livingston, Never Greater Slaughter is his book. Uh, I really love the world of early modern warfare. This is, uh, we're talking knights with guns, literally. Uh, okay. Medieval warfare and musketeers on we the don't, same We don't see a lot of that. I've not seen a lot of that anywhere in fiction or nobody, nonfiction. Nobody writes about it. Nobody writes about it. It's a little more popular in Europe, but nobody writes about it in the US. So I have a topic on that. Again, I don't want to spoil it, that I'm deep in research for, and I'm putting together a pitch package. And then I have a novel, uh, a sort of alternate history novel that I'm 78,000 words through. So uh, at some point I'll finish it and get that uh, knocked together. So I always like to have, I'm like you, I like to have three or four projects going on at once. Yeah. yeah. We're trying to get out of three or four projects going on at once, Mark. <laughs> I don't know that we'll ever be able to get out of it because my brain works a little bit like yours as well. Uh, right. All right. Mike, where do people find out more about you? Where is the best place to follow you these days to get these historical and fictional tidbits? Right. So I, I'm trying to use Twitter a lot less, uh, you know, no offense to anybody, but I just think that Twitter is, it's, it's a rough just, spot. It's a rough path. It's bad news. Um, I'm on there at Michael, M Y K E C O L E. Um, but really these days, if you want to see what's going on in my life, I'm on Instagram, Mike underscore Cole. Again, that's M Y K E. You can friend me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Mike Cole. And my website is Mike Cole.com M Y K E C O L E. We have one uh, question from the chat room. Are there any more details on the alternate history project? You said you can't talk about it yet. Is there anything else you can give for the peeps in the chat room? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's a perspective on a great battle. Um, it's a little twist on a perspective on a great battle. It is um, uh, it is mostly done, 70 of, of a first draft. Um, and uh, it is set in the ancient world. It's an ancient... Uh, piece. And um, I think that's all I can say for now. <laughs> and do you feel, uh, last question from me, do you, now that you're starting to get into alternate history, so that gets you back into the fictional, you can completely set the stage yourself, determine the narrative arc, determine all of the character development. Is that is that something that, because I, I think a guy like you gets into that, it might be hard to get back into pure fiction again. You know, is that is that a middle ground between the two or do you see that sort of taking you over as a creator? So, you know, this is funny, like I've had lots of people say you should do X or you should do Y, like you should write YA or you should write whatever. And I've never been able to do it. I've never, the only thing I've ever been able to do is get an idea, get excited about that idea and work on that idea. So if that truly happens that I, I get stuck in alternate history, then I guess that's where my brain is. If I have another original fiction idea, I mean, alternate history is original fiction, but you know, I know what you mean you know, then that's where it will take me. But at least right now, what's taken over my brain is, is these are the ideas I have. And these are the ones I'm going to chase until yeah. I can either sell them. One thing I do want to say to your listeners too, one of the reasons I'm not giving details is look, you never know when something's going to sell or not. Yeah. And I don't ever want to sort of promise or get people excited about a potential project. <laughs> and it winds up not, not, not being delivered. So I, you have, get a lot of I have, questions. I have oversold so many things so many times. So right. I'm sure my, my hardcore readers will appreciate you giving that the respect that, Hey, as soon as it's, as soon as I know it's going to be for sale, then I'll tell you about it. So that's right. That's right. Mike, thank you for being a monster of the week. I've learned more about centaurs, centaur, centaurs. I've learned more about centaurs than I ever thought. I'm trying to go back in my D and D memory from back in the day. I must have fought somebody. Can't quite recall it. But, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. And yeah. I will be following up with you in all the various places. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good night. All right. Bye-bye. Right. And I end this meeting and then I go back to the main. Hello, everyone. So Mike is so much expertise, so much knowledge in so many different areas. A wonderful, accessible guy. And uh, whether you are with his politics, not with his politics, he is a great dude. And if you get to know him online, you'll be happy. His Instagram feed is absolutely wonderful. Let me go back again to the upcoming guest. Let's take a look at what we've got. I could not be more excited for Gail Carriger, one of my favorite uh, author friends 
and uh, we used to kick around San Francisco a little bit, and she's great. I'm pumped. I also love that movie Underworld. There's so much to talk about with Celine, and that and and the, the, she is a monster that is the hero. We haven't got that a lot on this show, so that'll be very interesting. On November 12th, I I wish it was tomorrow that I get my buddy Bronson show on, who of course is the narrator for my book Aliens Phalanx, and is just a just a delightful dude. And we're gonna talk about very misunderstood woman, the Wicked Witch of the West. And then on November nineteenth, one of podcasting royalty from This Week in Science, which has been around for 15 years, the absolutely brilliant, engaging Dr. Kiki Sanford. I I just tweeted her again today. I DM'd her today like, you have to pick a monster. You can't just keep us hanging. But we got a couple weeks till all that comes up. So I will see you guys on November 5th, November 12th, November 19th. Somewhere in there, Dr. Kiki Sanford will figure out what her monster is. And then we have many, many more guests coming after that. You guys are all great. I hope you enjoy your Friday. If you in a, are in a job where you get to take the weekend off, take that weekend off. Uh, I do recommend this is a great book. I I will tell you though, Legion versus Phalanx is is spectacular. I don't read a lot of nonfiction. I don't read a lot of I, I've been reading more historical work lately, but um if you are at all into military, into battles, into military history, it it covers a period in time where a, a change in military tactics literally changed the entire course of history, changed the entire world. And frankly, it's little more than just rearranging the way soldiers stand on the field. And that subtle change, combined with a lot of other things, but that subtle change completely altered the course of history. And I guarantee you when you read this book, you will see it impacted your life wherever you are so it's wonderful. So that's Aliens versus Phalanx, or excuse me, Legion versus Phalanx, my favorite Mike Cole book, and I like all his nonfiction works too. But you guys are all great. We will be back next week. No, we won't be next week. We'll be back in November. You guys have a great time. My wife and I are going to go enjoy a wedding, hang out with a bunch of buddies. It's going to be awesome. And until then, we will be back with more monsters in November. Have a great week.